Good morning, everybody. Happy March break for those of you who are March breaking. Welcome to Marteloup Church. Today we are uh, continuing. We haven't done the same topic over two months, but we're going to continue with the same topic uh, through the end of this month and next month. Hey, Leyland, how you doing? He's just saying hello and welcoming everybody this morning. Okay, we're going to continue with Old Testament Bible stories with a look at the story of the Exodus. Now, at its core, the story of the Exodus is a story about a God who basically sees enslaved people and the predicament that they're in and saves them, saves them via an Exodus. It's about a God who has compassion on those he loves, on those who are suffering, a God who will do whatever it takes to help those who are suffering, who sets slaves free, whatever they're enslaved to. So God sees the plight of all of those people in Mariupol this week, like we've seen it, right? And your heart breaks and you just, why? And there's incredulity and maybe anger. That is a subset. We're imaging God's heart towards the travesty of those people who are enslaved by war. God sees people in two-thirds world countries who are slaves to poverty or bad government or dictatorships. And God even sees us in our rich, consumeristic, materialistic Western societies enslaved to materialism and stuff and anxiety, and angst, and all the things that imprison us. And more precisely, God sees you feeling abused by that situation, or that war, or that treatment. God sees the mistreated, or those, any person who's robbed of human dignity. God sees, and God acts, God acts through things that are like an exodus. So, the exodus is our story today, and I'm basically going to kind of tell the whole really long story in a much shorter fashion, and then add some theological uh, connections as we go through. But before we get into that, we're going to start with a prayer, and then uh, Dan's going to lead us in a couple of songs. So, uh, please join me in a prayer. Again, God, we pray for those imprisoned and enslaved by war, by forced migration, by the anxiety and pain of family separation, by depression, by fear or doubt, those imprisoned by Bars they can't see in terms of a cultural milieu that supports a kingdom, an empire that isn't always in line with your kingdom, your empire. Those who have, like me, like all of us, all too human hearts who say one thing about what we want and who we want to be before you, and then are so quick to forget and head off in another direction or doubt or fear. So to and for all of us, be a God who leads us through a freeing movement, through an exodus, we pray. And in a little way this morning, may that happen in all of our hearts, we pray. In Christ's name we pray, amen. In the book of the Exodus, we learn that 3,500 years ago, the Hebrew people were slaves in the country of Egypt. The Egyptian pharaoh saw them as a threat because they were growing and growing in number and ergo power in pharaoh's mind. And the Egyptian people as a whole oppressed the Hebrew people greatly. They were slaves. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. 
And the Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out their cry for help because of their slavery. And because they cried out, and cried out, and because their cry, and I'll try it all again. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning, as real as you're hearing the groaning of people enslaved this week. God hears our groaning. And he remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. Which should have been the first shot over Pharaoh's Pharaoh's bow. Because when God's concerned about something. When God's people are in trouble, he looks on them and is concerned for them. And then God acts, and God acts in this story the way God often acts in the Bible stories, by entering into the life of one of his people and calling them into the freeing Exodus process. In this case, Moses. A bit of a longer reading now. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, And he led the flock. Moses had run away. Moses was hiding. Moses was ducking uh, his former life. The priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. And there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. And Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. And so Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why does this bush not burn up? When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, Moses, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. And so now, go, Moses. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. When God acts, God acts through you. Probably more correctly, you who say, here I am, God. Through people. We take on the voice of God in addressing injustice, in bringing freedom. When it comes to speaking truth to power, it is the calling of God's people to speak in that voice, to be God's hands and feet. But Moses tries to get out of his call. Thank God I'm never that way in my life, certainly haven't been that way for the last six months and going through the pandemic. Just let's bail and find an easier place. Even though the call, so definitive, so clear, this thing. Moses says, quote, Who am I to lead this exodus to God? I've never been eloquent to God. What if they don't believe you sent me to God? Please send someone else, he says to God. 
he was afraid. And so he stubbornly tried to duck a hard calling and obstinately, arguably, pushed back on God, whose face, just earlier, he couldn't bear to lift his eyes to. God's lead guy in one of the greatest stories, spiritual stories of redemptive history, the Exodus, didn't want the job. After a burning bush experience with God, and maybe you've had one, a moment, and yet, I'll pass. How quickly we forget But thank God, God would not take no for an answer. And God would not let Moses stand in the way of his saving plan. I will be with you, he says to Moses. I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. And after that, Pharaoh will let you go. Who gave human beings their mouths, Moses, God asks? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go. I will help you speak and teach you what to say. So Moses finally conceded. And with the help of his brother, part of his concession, negotiation, he stepped into his calling. And what a calling. God says to Moses that I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. So when God calls you into writing an injustice, God calls you to be God's representative. You will be like God to these people. Imagine that. Imagine stepping into the power of that. Imagine your voice so in sync with the spirit and will of God that it has an efficacy that would cause wonders to happen in terms of bringing freedom to the oppressed. So can you see what's happening here in this Moses story, this Exodus story? God saves others through us, and then God saves us through the process of saving others. We're saved through the saving Every time you post a lost girl in our province or you, 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 you post something online, Shannon, about somebody who has a need, I think you're echoing that. And God is saving you even as you're helping in some small way try to save someone else. So God sent Moses back to the story to Pharaoh at first to ask him politely if he would let his people go. But Pharaoh's hard heart was hardened and would not listen to God. And instead, he made things even worse for the people of Israel, which then led them into an even worse place to not listen to God like Pharaoh. God told Moses, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. And then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And I will bring you to the land I swore you with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord, God is saying through Moses, is saying to the people. So Moses reported this to the Israelites, but they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and hard labor. And I know we all know this place, the place where you can be so discouraged and so broken or so angry 
or so needing to be in that corner by yourself that you reject the help of those who are able to help you. And even as that's happened in your life at times, it happens in your life, I think, much more often in relation to the help that the exodus bringing God wants to bring to you. So discouraged, you just can't muster the courage to believe or hope anymore. So angry that you become obstinate in your response and don't listen to others, to God. And how does God react to our obstinance? Well, he does the same thing he did with Moses when Moses wanted to duck his call. He ignores their stubbornness and saves them anyway. Thank God. Frees them with a saving miracle. Wonders, God says. Ten miracles in the form of ten plagues. Horrible miracles. Judging miracles designed to undermine the power of a controlling empire. Which makes me think, boy, could we use that have that fall upon uh, an atheistic controlling empire right now. The Nile River, the source of economic sustenance for Egypt, was made unpotable. Then there were frogs and gnats and flies and livestock wasting disease. All of that was like economic warfare, knocking them out of the SWIFT system, not including them in global trading anymore, making them pay a price for the enslavement that they were bringing to a people. And then a plague of boils, causing a huge health care shock. And then plagues of hail, locusts, and darkness, severe environmental upheaval coming to that part of the world. And then finally, a terrible plague on the firstborn of every family and animal dying. Almost all the firstborn. But you, you my people, God says, need to put some blood on your doorposts, a sacrificial sign, a mark of faith. On that same night when those firstborn would die, I will pass through Egypt and strike every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. And the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. And that's it. That's the moment where the Jewish Passover first began. And then finally, after that terrible plague, the people of Israel were set free. And Moses was God to Pharaoh. Now you think after that, Moses, he could never forget, right? He could never say no again. He could never try to duck God's call. He could never blow it in the ways he had previously. And yet, as the story goes, Pharaoh changed his mind, went after those slaves with the whole of his army, and cornered them at the Red Sea. And then, as God does, God saves his people again saying these words to them there, to us here, to you there. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring to you today. The Egyptians you see today, the oppressive forces you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. And they were still. And the enemy horde was destroyed. And God made a saving way, an unimaginable saving way, through the sea. Through the impediment. Through the thing you think was immovable. And that there was no way forward, God makes a way right through the middle of that, on dry ground. 
And then through a desert, a desert, by providing water that just came out of a rock one day. And then food from the heavens and ten laws from the mountaintop, from the heart and mind of God. And again and again and again in this long Exodus journey, God saved them. And over and over, God freed them. And still those people that Moses and Aaron were leading fell over and over again into faithlessness. This is the story of the Exodus. They cried out in desperation when they were cornered at the Red Sea. They were near to stoning Moses in the desert when they got to a certain point of thirst. Then this miraculously supplied food from heaven, after a while they started complaining about that because it was the same all the time. And then ultimate idolatry of idolatries. They make a golden calf when God is slow to respond with Moses coming down off the mountain and worshipped a statue instead. And Moses and Aaron blew it. Moses who was God to them, Aaron who was a prophet to Moses who was God to them, they messed up again and again. Aaron led the people to make the golden calf to provide an alternative God because he was so concerned about saving his own bacon and them not revolting against him that he'd rather take the easy way of leading them to a false God. Moses struck a rock the second time the community needed water when all God said was just talk to the rock and was saying something to God in the striking action. Such is the state of our all too human hearts. And again, it's been killing me these last seven or eight days contemplating these people who could dare to act that way. What have you done for me lately, God? It scares the daylights out of me as a church leader. Because if you think you're not susceptible to that, then you're not in tune with your heart. And I say that because I know it's true of me. So much doubt at times. Moments of faithlessness. So quick to forget the amazing things and affirmations and wonders already God has done. Has done throughout our lives keeping us. And we forget. Last night at 3 a.m. again I'm forgetting. (laughs) Although not completely but fighting an amnesic propensity to forget And that's the power in my mind of the story of the Exodus because that is the kind of people that God will do anything to save. You are the kind of people who are that kind of people that God will continue to reach out to try to save again and again and again and again and again until you get it and until he gets you home. People that broken, that forgetful, that prone to scramble and try to control things all the time. When all God is calling us to do is be still and wait for the wonders of God to be revealed. And so, in the Exodus story, the sad part of the ending is you know, the people do make it to the promised land and enter into it, but not Moses. Not all of those people who complained in the desert, their children are the ones who ended up stepping into what God has promised because of their disobedience and obstinance. So God is that willing to give us free will that God lets us either choose to follow God into that beautiful new land or choose not to. 
God respects your will so much, God will let you choose less. And that, in a very brief nutshell, is the story of the Exodus. A story about a God who strives to save us in spite of ourselves. And how hopeful is that if you're in tune with your heart and have struggled with some of these things? God continues to call you and will continue to call you. I mean, God didn't abandon Moses as he looked over the land and died in that place. God drew him, surely God drew him to himself, his people, my guy. You. But you know, as C.S. Lewis writes, sometimes, you know, we're like kids at the sea playing and making muck piles, and we forget to lift our, eye, lift our eyes and see that there's an ocean there. We're at the seaside. And God offers us a choice. Connecting to Easter coming up in a couple of weeks. God is a God who saves those who would crucify him. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. As I said a few weeks ago, at our worst, God is at God's best. So powerful and persistent and forgiving and merciful and compassionate is the love of God. Because he is our Lord, the compassionate and gracious God slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, and maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. That's the grace of God. In that one verse there, God will judge, and God will leave us to our choices. And God is always a God who is compassionate and gracious and slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. In, in all of those people, in that ancient millennia-old story, and in all of us people here. So there's hope in that. <laughs> it's a pretty pathetic story, those people. As are we, right? But there's hope in that. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for uh, a, f a freedom bringing story with so much complexity and grayness and middle space and um, with a lack of clarity that somehow through all of those things leaves room for us. Complex, uh, broken, made for glory, made in the image of God people. And we pray as we as individuals and as families and as, as a community gathering around uh, this little church, Martaloop Church, uh, continue on the Exodus faith journey that you have us on. That, that knowing who we are and knowing who you are, we can just continue to be real. Um, not as a license to not strive to do better, but as an admission of who we are before you, God. People you love. People you want to save. People you're taking to a good and beautiful promised land. So take us there, we pray. All of us there. 
we pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. and uh, sing with me if you'd like.
You can have a seat. Paz was looking at your guitar and seeing again that it's a Gibson Les Paul. It's a real one, right? <laughs> hey, I say that because when I was 16 years old, I bought a black Gibson Les Paul for 100 bucks back in Ontario and then discovered that it was only the neck of the Gibson Les Paul slapped onto another guitar. So sad. So every time I see it, I'm reliving that story and falling into deeper and deeper. Thanks, Dan. Depression. Because his is real. Okay, a couple of announcements. Um, email is crucial if you want to be in the loop for what this church is doing, I'm realizing. Because people send you a note and they're not on the email list and they didn't know we had a thing last Thursday. And so if you're tracking with Bartolup Church and you want to know what's happening week to week, email. We send one out every Wednesday kind of detailing what's up that weekend and what lies ahead so you can keep in the loop. Uh, second thing, um, we're doing a, a, what's the egg called? The Ukrainian egg, Hank? Pasanki egg decorating thing. Sherry, Hank's wife, is leading it. She sends me a note connecting to my Ukrainian heritage. So I almost wanted to drive over and just give her a hug because of that heritage. But it, what a great opportunity if you're artistically oriented and uh, I want to learn how to do that. Um, we sent an email out this week describing that. And so get on the email list and you'll get more details this week. If Sherry was here, I'd make her come up and describe it with much more eloquence, but uh, we'll get her up here next time. Uh, third thing, uh, giving for the church, thank you. Um, almost everybody is giving uh, online now, but some still give uh, and make the donation in that beautiful oak handmade box in the back table there. Um, so we take, yeah, I called it a little brown box the other day, and Dennis kind of pulls me aside, and evidently was the guy who made it. So, yeah, don't diss anything that looks like it could be made in this place, because somebody probably made it, right? Don't diss the lights, because Hank and Sherry were up on scaffolding installing the lights, right? Don't diss the paint job or the choice of color because somebody stewarded all of that. Holy ground. All right, I think that is, yeah, just a thank you for giving. And uh, yeah, we have our, our classes meeting, our regional church meeting here on October 8th and 9th, Friday and Saturday morning. And uh, Friday night is when we have an evening service starting at 7 o'clock. And that moved that time. We originally thought it was six, but it's going to be seven. And people are, it's not just for the regional reps coming together. It includes our community. And if you guys want to come, uh, you're more than welcome to come to that. And it's kind of the official welcome to me joining the church because two years ago when that happened, it was all online via Zoom, saying my vows, you know, paying my penance, washing feet. Um, but now uh, it's just going to be kind of a formal welcome. And it will be our church service that week. So normally next week would be uh, uh, online, but it's going to be, no, two weeks from now would have been an online, but it's going to be a live event on that Friday, the 8th. And next week, oh, last thing, I'll just keep going and going and going. Esther, those of you who were here last Thursday when we were looking at Rembrandt's etchings and kind of doing a Visio Divina, which was the coolest thing, um, and we're all just tripping on this, trying to figure this out, right? Next time we do it, we'll all be pros. But um, uh, I gave the people who attended uh, an etching, a printout of the etching of uh, the, the raising up of Mordecai in the eyes of the people. And that's the end of the book of Esther, and that's going to be the sermon topic next week. So if you're coming next week, and even if you're not, you can read that story, because it is one of the best stories in the Old Testament. It's just great storytelling. No real mention of God, and yet God is moving through this story in such a powerful way. So, so read the story of Esther for homework this week, and that's it. All right, stand for a blessing, and then we're going to sing one more song together. And thanks for uh, coming out today. May the grace of God, your Heavenly Father... Father who frees his people, and the love and mercy and compassion and forgiveness of his son Jesus Christ, uh, one who did take up the call and brought that freedom to fruition, and the power, uh, life-strengthening, 
call uh, concretizing presence of God's Holy Spirit be with and abide with you all. Amen. So unusual is frightening See right through the mess inside me and Call me out, pull me in Tell me I can start again And I don't need to keep on hiding Cause I'm fully known And loved by you You won't let go no matter what I do And it's not one or the other It's our truth and ridiculous grace To me known, fully known And loved by you Fully known And loved by you So like you to keep pursuing